This podcast provides a platform to discuss important questions and complex issues, challenge the status quo, and confront the boundaries of the establishment. I'm retired police chief Daniel Hahn. I went from being arrested at 16 to serving over 34 years in law enforcement. My goal is to keep you informed with news not being reported, voices not being heard, and the untold history of how we got here so that we can create a way forward. All right, so today on A Way Forward, uh, special guest is Krista Armstead. I'm gonna try to get some titles or roles, but I will not come anywhere close. So Krista's a mom, a uh, daughter, a pastor, now an author, author. Um, a big sister, yep. a niece, yep. uh, and the list can go on and a on. A wife and on. of 37 years, oh, got to add oh, that. Oh, yes, yes you gotta for add sure got to add that. <laughs> wife of 37 <laughs> years. I'm, I'm nowhere close, but I'm working on that. <laughs> You're working uh, on it. You're and Katrina doing good. I, I have to tell you, we'll get to your book in a little bit, but uh, I think I've mentioned this earlier. My wife is a school teacher, and she always tells me not to tell people this, that I don't read. Mm-hmm. Um, I can read. I just, it's not fun to me. It'll put me to sleep, unless it's a history book or a sports book, but I couldn't put your book down. Wow. Uh, and it felt like I could relate to so many things in your book. So we'll get to that in a minute. But I want people listening to um, get to feel and understand a little bit of, of like the roots and who you are before mm-hmm. we get into some of how we move on to tomorrow in mm-hmm. our communities. Mm-hmm. So maybe talk a little bit about um, your early kind of life and really which is a big part of what I think inspired this book yep so people can kind of relate so talk a little bit about like who your father was what those circumstances your mom went through and all those sort of things yeah thank you thank you I, I said I didn't know if to call you chief I know you as chief on <laughs> but also as Daniel so I've been you. called much worse so <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, thank you for having me on. Uh, So I was born in 1967. I think this is ironic to me. This is a year that Loving versus Virginia was passed. Before that, it was illegal, you know, to have an interracial marriage. My mom was a brilliant, bright student at a all-girls Catholic school in San Fernando Valley. And she met my father, uh, was a Catholic priest. Her counselor. Okay, wait, back. Your father was who? A Catholic priest. Okay her counselor, and he mentored her. So um, we, I don't think they had a term for it probably back then, but um, we call it grooming today. Mm-hmm. So my mom met my father around 14 years of age, and somewhere along their relationship, it moved from an appropriate relationship of mentoring and encouraging her to something inappropriate. And out of that, I was conceived. And shortly thereafter, of course, you know, priests aren't supposed to be having uh, relationships with sexual, anybody with sexual relationship with anybody let alone their students so this was like a big secret and so um, the plan was never to tell anyone who the father was to go to a home for unwed mothers and then secretly give me up for adoption well she did that but when she got to this home for unwed mothers she I don't know she got in a conversation with someone and she disclosed that the father was white now she didn't tell that he was a priest but she just said the father was white and I think they said, well, you do know your, your child may not ever go and, you know, be adopted by a family. She could just end up or they could end up just, you know, in an orphanage. So she may, made this. May, let me interject real quick. Uh-huh. Maybe talk about that a little bit, because I think or I know now it's much different than in 1967, if you will, yeah, in terms exactly. of the race issue right. with mixed race children. Right. Um, so talk a little bit what you feel that that counselor or that caseworker meant by you might not get adopted because you're half white, half black. Right. It was like, you know, we we all know Angelina Jolie, right, and Brad Pitt. They adopted basically the United Nations, and it's very common today um, for people to adopt, you know, kids that are the same culture, don't look like them. But back then, that was taboo. Uh, Again, just imagine you couldn't even get married in 1967 if you were, you know, black and and white. So... uh, most assuredly, I probably would not have gotten right. adopted. So Absolutely. my mom had to make this very brave decision to defy the Catholic Church because at that point, they're, they're really pressuring. I found out later that they really pressured young girls like, you got to give these babies up. And so when she discovered And your mom that, was very much into the Catholic Church at that very time. Very much. I, late, years later, you know, she didn't talk about it a lot when I was growing up, but years later, I learned that she wanted to be a nun. 
So this this rocked her world. This it had changed, to be a tough. Right. This tough. this changed her world. And so she didn't give me up for adoption. She decides to keep me. My father comes to visit me when I'm about three months old, and um, and he walks out of our life, never to, never to return till years later. But he leaves this unwed black teenager that he mentored in the '60s. In the '60s now, when women don't have rights and black people don't have rights, and right. basically says, "I'm out." You know, you figure out how to raise this baby. So that led to a whole series of. Um, some things that I've written about in this book. One of the things is poverty. You know, it put put us definitely in in situations of poverty, and um, the communities that I grew up in. Like I said, I didn't see a lot of mixed kids, um, and I had this flaming red hair. Like, so I just couldn't <laughs> I couldn't fit in. I couldn't hide out. Flaming red hair and freckles. I was tall for my you know as I got older. So um, a lot of just trying to fit in and survive well, surviving. Yeah. And back uh, as you read through your book, uh, not on purpose or not of anything that you did necessarily, but mm -hmm. the issue of race and mixed race played a big role. I mean, there's several times in your book where you are trying to cut your hair, you're trying to stay out. You talked about out sunning at the pool to get darker, right? Yeah. So talk a little bit about what that, growing up in an impoverished black community mm -hmm. and being red hair, freckles, light and skin. very fair skin, very, um, very fair skin. What, what challenges that presented to you? Well, so- And again, the things your mom said to you yeah. about- Yeah, so again, it's night, it's the six, it's 67, it's 70s. We we moved to, my mom tried to go to Stanford. She went to Stanford for like one semester, then had to drop out, but she was always continuing her education, but we lived in Palo Alto. And so my mom became, um, was sort of kind of getting involved with the Black Panthers but then she got involved with the Nation of Islam instead. So this was the era where black people or African Americans were discovering like their beauty in the sense of them. So you, the story, the funny story, so my mom is brown, very beautiful, very regal. And back then she had this big, almost Angela Davis, hopefully the viewers, listeners Afro, know. Afro, yes. Yeah, Afro, right? And so I wanted to, I saw myself in the image of my mother and I saw her beauty and I wanted to be beautiful and I wanted to have Afro. Well. <laughs> I pleaded with her for weeks. Mommy, cut my hair, cut my hair, cut my hair. And I was in preschool. I wasn't even in elementary school yet, probably around four years old. So finally, I guess I passed her up and she said, okay, I'm going to cut it. She cuts my hair and it turns into these ringlet, ringlets that kind of stick to my Not head. Afro, it didn't turn into the Afro. I was like, <laughs> I look like a boy. I was just, you know, so that was my idea. I didn't have a idea of, I knew I was different and I knew my mom was different, but I just wanted to fit in and I wanted to I wanted my existence to be um, how I saw my mother in this image of beauty. And you know, it was some of the things that I've struggled with my whole life of where do I fit in and what is my image of value and um, acceptance in whatever communities I'm in. So I want to get into a little bit about the neighborhoods and the communities that you grew up in, mm -hmm. like the jungle. Yes. Um, but before I get to that, um, you spend a lot of time talking about what education yes. meant to your mother yep. and what that instilled in you. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about education and your mom and mm -hmm. in your home and, mm -hmm. and what like sounds like was drilled into yeah. your head yeah, yeah. over and over, yeah. which I think is oftentimes in impoverished communities, um, you don't have that dedication mm -hmm. um, from a parent that's mm -hmm. so dedicated to it. Talk a little bit about that. Well, there were a couple of things that my mom was dedicated to. One, she was dedicated to, uh, back then, if you had one drop of black blood, you were black. And so she was dedicated to making me feel very proud to be black. So that was one of the things that, you know, I was, when I was in, in preschool and young in elementary school, I didn't, grow, I learned about Marcus Garvey, I learned, not just MLK, but right. it just Christmas addicts, the first revolutionary, you know, black fall in the Revolutionary War. So she was really adamant about, giving me that that sense of value as being a as being a black person and then secondly from the time i remember she i mean young she was always telling me you're 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 brilliant you're smart you're going to go to college because i think education was so important to her and it was obviously interrupted with my birth but she never stopped pursuing her education she actually graduated college got her ba when she was from ucla when she was like 40. and so not only did she instill that in me but it's something also that she instilled in me that then she later instilled in all of our kids. She would take them on these field trips when they were little. Like my son went to 
take them to USC, Children's Museum, and all these places, right? She's to the grant. Yeah. Next generation, yeah, too. Yeah, next generation. So education was always important to her, and she's like, this is how you'll make your mark in the world. This is how you make a difference. It's and I might add, one of your sons did go to USC. Did, yeah, that's the, yeah. <laughs> Armand did go to USC, and all of them have gone to college and, you know, have their degrees, and so. Awesome. As do I. So, um, and you have your degree from where? So my first degree is from William Jessup University, and then I'm working on one. I, I walk in May from North Park University, which is in Chicago. So oh, awesome. With a master's. Awesome. So you don't have to turn on the news very frequently to see mm -hmm. um, often impoverished communities with violence yeah. and crime. Yeah. And it seems like everybody is supposedly trying to figure out how do we help uh, the neighborhoods, and I'll, wow. I'll just leave it at supposedly. Yeah, supposedly. Um, but talk a little bit about, you grew up in a neighborhood called The Jungle. Yep. And uh, so talk a little bit about what was the norm for The Jungle, and what did that present in terms of young people as yourself mm -hmm. as a kid growing mm -hmm. up? What challenges does that kind of environment present to young kids fully being able to realize yeah. or chase their dreams. Yeah. So if you've seen the movie Training Day with Denzel, I did. That was that was based on a, our my neighborhood, the jungle, where he really? was Really? Yeah. He was in the jungle. He was act those are real apartments that weren't too far from where I grew up. Okay, I think now I have a feeling I can feel like what it's like now. There there you go. <laughs> I think one of the things I was telling someone just sharing this the other day is I never felt safe growing up. I feel I felt so I felt unprotected often. You have to you have to learn to survive. You have to have good instinctual skills that just, you know, tell you like how do I how do I get out of this situation and how am I gonna get out of that? So just my whole life I felt like I was always trying to figure out how I was gonna protect myself. My mom had to work, which meant that I had to, you know, get on the school bus or walk to school and it was just never safe. By the time I was in uh, in junior high, literally I have I wrote about some of this in the book. I know four friends personally that were killed through gang violence or, or violence. These are young people that never even made it out of high school. So yeah. I would say the predominant feeling is just how am I going to survive? What skills is it going to take for me to, you know, to get, hopefully get out of high school and get, you know, to, to live to see adulthood? So there's a fear, but that sense of fear just drives you to figure out how am I going to be resourceful and resilient enough just to survive? Right. So. And I want to talk two other things. One, uh, kind of a sensitive topic, but at one point, as a very young person, mm -hmm. you decided and kind of planned and, and plotted, if you will, mm -hmm. on how you would harm yourself. Mm -hmm. um, uh, basically, like, get away from mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things, in talking to uh, mental health professionals mm -hmm. that has always stuck out to me for many, many years now, that they say it's usually like a moment in time. Yes. And if you can get that person Beyond through that, that moment yes. in time, they might never again yes. Yes. attempt to harm themselves. Yep. And your story kind it's, of it's kind of that. reinforces that. It's, it's kind so of that. Maybe speak to uh, a little bit about what were the circumstances that made you do that, and what were the very unique thing that got you through it. Yeah. Because uh, you you detail that in your book. Yeah. I think just that feeling of I didn't feel hope for a future. And I totally agree with you. Um, I would say divine, there was divine intervention on my life that night. I took these pills and I thought, you know, um, this is it. I, when, I, when I imagined it, I thought I'd write a suicide note, but I was just so hopeless as a young person. I think I was in the eighth grade. I just didn't see a future for myself. I just didn't see a life in which I would be thriving and happy. And that was such a lie. Like you said, if you can just get young people through this moment, um, I, I, I often speak to, I speak it to young people and I share my story about, about that. And it's just so interesting, the number of hands that will go up and they're almost like they're in disbelief that I'm have a good life today. It's, you know, they'll ask me like, but you're happy today. you like, and they know me, you yeah. know, if they know me, they go, Oh, but you got this great family. You've got this great life and a, not a great life where we're not talking about financial things. We're not talking about driving them, you know, a certain right, type of right. car or living in a certain neighborhood. We're talking about real value, real impact, real. I have so many people that love me, but I couldn't see that back right. then. I didn't, I didn't see having 
four amazing kids, nine grandchildren. Chief Honor got nine grandchildren. <laughs> nine grandchildren. And you might not be done yet. You know, you know, I don't think I am. I don't think I am. <laughs> you know, this great community of people that I get to be involved with and serve, I didn't see any of that purpose. So like you said, uh, we have something going on uh, next week, and I'll be speaking at that, and I'll be sharing that. Like, if you can just get through, just don't do something right now. If you can just get through this month, you know, we can pair you with a mentor this month. And then if hopefully that month turns into a year and then hopefully, you know, that year turns into a future. You know, there's a young man at our church that we met at um, his. I can I hope he doesn't mind, but his name is Richard. And we met him at Leotata Floyd Elementary mm -hmm. when he was probably in the third grade. He's now 18. And I was just telling him the other day how proud I am of him because of all the changes that he's made, the transformation that he's made. He's like just a, a different kid. So he's made it through 18 and hopefully he's got a great life ahead of him and a future ahead of him that I don't think he realized he had when we when met him. Was, yeah, 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 in third you know, grade. Yeah. yeah, in third grade. So it's important. So talk, I, I just want people to understand sometimes, and I think you re just a mm -hmm. few seconds ago called it divine intervention. Yeah, divine intervention. But what, what occurred after you took those pills that really like, it feels like it almost immediately yeah. snapped you out of that state of mind. I think there was just this realization. It was a strange realization that I didn't want to die. I just didn't know how I was going to live. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that kind of took away this feeling. I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to die, but hopefully something will change. And a few years later it did. So I, one, uh, I moved away to Sacramento so that was good. I went to college, you know, so I had things to dream about again. And to, I, I always have to bring this up. What college were you going to? When I you was came going to Sac, Sac State. I the Harvard of the West, of course. Yeah, the Harvard yes. of the West, of course. <laughs> <laughs> the Harvard of the West, of course, where I met my husband. So my future changed not too long. The trajectory of my future changed not too long after that through just making it past that moment. And then, you know, go, to, go away to college, realize that I've got great purpose there meet my husband, realize, you know, I got great purpose there, join a community of faith, realize I've got great purpose there. Uh, in Oak Park is the community of faith that I joined in 1985-86, and I just dove all the in. The best like, neighborhood in Sacramento. The best, right, right, the best, right? I just dove in of how can we make a change and how can we make differences and how can we love on people, and I'm still kind of that same person today, just how can I love on people of all ages, all ethnic backgrounds, wherever I'm at, I just want to say, hey, I see you, I acknowledge you, I acknowledge your worth and want to kind of like lift your spirits. And your move to Sac State uh -huh. was intentional. Yes. Right? Like uh -huh. you were going to a university in Southern yeah, Cal. Cal State Dominguez Hills. And you came to Sac State on purpose because why? I just needed to get out of LA. I needed something different. I visited Sacramento. I was like, y'all's a city of trees. We're the concrete jungle. Y'all had all these beautiful trees. And I just thought this is a good place for me to put down some roots. I never intended to stay as long as I have, you know, live here, but at that time it seemed like a good place to put down roots. And then I found community and I found family and I found a lot of other things that has caused me to stay. So in part, you took control of some portions too. Yeah. Right? Like you I intentionally that. made some decisions. Some just, yeah. So uh, not to get off the jungle too okay, far. Okay, not to get off the jungle. Uh, <laughs> at one point, and I didn't know this until I read your book actually, um, you were shot. Uh, yes. So talk about how that occurred and and I might add what actually facilitated that was the kindness of a stranger of a and stranger. the compassion of a, a good, stranger a in Samaritan. a challenging neighborhood who knew yes. that she was putting herself and in her danger, children in, in danger. At risk. So like I said, we grew up in the jungle, which was as long as I can remember, you know, riddled with gangs and, and drugs and all the devices that you, all the vices that you would think of food deserts that we didn't know were food deserts back then, right, right. Um, you know, um, not access to much, much. But so I, one night I was living with my aunt It's my senior year of high school. And um, I'm, I'm just saying this too, for young men, I feel like in certain communities, it's a lot harder. Like, Chief Han, I don't know how you didn't end up in gangs. Because for young men, it's like, you gotta, you gotta join, you gotta affiliate, you gotta do something, you gotta affiliate. It's very hard to escape, you know, getting in with the wrong crowds for young right. men. So young women, it's a little bit easier, you know, not a, as much pressure to join the gangs. Well, back then, I don't know what it is like now, but, so my cousin kind of affiliated. 
just to kind of get get through to get through right to survive. We talked <laughs> right. about that survival. Right. So him and a friend, and he was a kind of a larger than life guy. He was larger. Him and a friend end up in this wrong neighborhood, and I don't know why he he had on a red shirt. He should have known better. So we get this a call. We're cooking dinner. We get this call. This good Samaritan calls and said, "Get over to this address. Come right away. Your son's been hurt." So we get there. My cousin is has been stripped of his clothes. He's been this beat. is you and your aunt. Yeah, me and my aunt. Right. Sorry that I was living with. We get to the Good Samaritan's house, very frail house, and my cousin's ble- bleeding, and he's been beaten, and he's been um, stomped on, jaw broken. I mean, his face was unrecognizable. So I'm trying to figure out how we can get him out of the house, and I kind of see this car kind of circling a little bit, but I'm, I'm I'm very naive, just like I am now. I'm just not paying attention. So we get let ins- you tell it. Yeah, let me tell it. <laughs> so we get inside the house. We're trying to figure out how we're going to get my cousin into the car and get him to the hospital. And I go by the window, and all of a sudden, like, my aunt's like, get away from the... And before she could get window out, literally, like, pop, 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 pop. So we, we're crawling on the floor. We're, like, freaked out. We're headed we're going to the back bedroom. We're thinking the guys that beat him have now come to finish the job. And I'm, I'm huddled up in this woman's back, back of her house. We're shut the lights off, and we're just scared. I'm thinking, okay, this is it. Now I'm going to die for sure. If I tried to take my life earlier, now I don't really want to die, and I definitely mm-hmm. don't want to die like this. So we're back hunched up in the, in, the, in the bedroom, and we hear this kind of knock at the door, and then your people come in. <laughs> <laughs> to save the day. To save the day. To save the day. <laughs> so they're like, LAPD, and they come in the back. And you thought it was actually I thought it was the a gang, gang members Yeah, I thought in. they were kicking the door in, because we thought they had, you know, they, they literally meant to finish this job, yeah. right? To finish this job. So LAPD comes in, they're shining their flashlights, and I'm feeling this warm sensation on my back. And I'm like, I've been shot. Now, my cousin looks terrible. Like, he right. looks like he's not going to make it. Right. So they're really focused on him. They're, they're like, oh, be quiet. You, you, you're not shot. And I said, okay, but I think I've been shot. So the officer does eventually flash his light on my jumpsuit, and there's a small bullet hole there in my jumpsuit. Wow. Now, I'm not feeling like pain, but I'm thinking, no, I'm really going to die. I'm going to die. Right. So they put us on the stretchers, and they carry us out. And it's, you know, the neighborhood's all standing around watching. Take us to Daniel Freeman Hospital down in Los Angeles. And eventually, a doctor comes in. He holds up an x-ray. He says, young lady, you're very lucky. He said, I see where the bullet hole went in, but I don't see the bullet there anymore. And I don't, I don't see where it came out. So we're not going to do anything but just send you home. But I never forgot that. I'm like... I was shot. I don't know how that bullet, and I had like a little cigarette hole on my back just to remind me right. of that incident. And then shortly there, the next year, I went away to college again. So there again, that divine intervention was protecting me. And my my cousin had his had to have his jaw wired. You know, he was in the house. His, his recovery was much longer than mine, even though I was shot and he wasn't. But I never forgot that. Then years later, Chief Han, I'm living in Sacramento. My husband, Gus, and I met at Sac State. We're now married. I think we had one one child at the time, my oldest, Aaron. I get a call from the DA of L.A. And so he's so the district attorney calls. It's like, hey, is this Krista Hobbs? So I'm knowing it's from the past because I'm now Krista Armstead. He's like, this is the district, this is the district attorney's office of L.A. They wanted me to come testify. Now that same person that had gotten, they, they, they did arrest mm-hmm. him that evening. It was like about five or six guys. They, they never did anything because we didn't see them, so we couldn't testify against them and say we saw somebody. But I guess they continued a life of trouble and crime, and they had a capital murder case. And I was you know, trying to be a good Samaritan myself, thinking about the good Samaritan. I was like, yeah, I, I might come testify. My husband said, no, you're not. <laughs> you're and, not. and why? What, what, what it, was the concern? Yeah, safety. It's like you're not going to L.A. to testify against anybody. So I had to call the DA back and said, well, my husband said <laughs> I would come, but my husband said I can't. And, you know, and that just closed a chapter in my life. So I don't know whatever happened with that. But um, It's interesting you say that because in talking to Gus recently, your husband, uh-huh. he said, uh, oh, we've, I've gone down to where you grew up oh, yeah. in the jungle. He goes, yeah. I was scared. Yes. He goes, it's no, Broad daylight, it's no he's joke. <laughs> and he goes to the point where I was looking at my kids on what covers they were yeah, wearing. Yeah. Right. And so to this story you just told about getting shot and your mm-hmm. cousin. So simply because of the neighborhood you live and in, the, color the cover wearing. of your shirt right. can put your entire your, life in jeopardy and your family's and life your, and someone else's family, the good Samaritan who let us in. Yeah. 
Like, I don't know what happened to her. And her kids. And her she kids. had kids at she the house, kids. right? And yeah. her house was all shot up. I don't know so if they had So simply trying of... to see, help somebody you exactly. see that's hurt exactly. out on your doorstep. Exactly. Could you have to decide, do I really want to put my yeah. and my family's safety in yeah. jeopardy to help another human being? Yeah. And I think we have to understand that, that that's... That's the reality in some neighborhoods. Right, right. Um, that was your reality right. growing and up. And I think, Chief Han, if we could just, t you know, I know probably our lives aren't, well, yours was in the, in the line of work that you did, but I know we're not putting our lives physically in jeopardy necessarily, but I think that still premise carries over in my mind today of like, am I willing, like today before I was coming over here, I'm just thinking, what can I do with my life? What can I do with my voice that may cause me some discomfort. That may put me, yeah. have me to put myself out, you know, to um, give up my comfort to help somebody else, to be a good Samaritan. Well, and I think you come from that, right? With all the challenges your mom yeah. might have had throughout the years, yeah, it 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 had to be a major decision yeah. to not do what she was told to do, yeah, by society, by her community, yeah. by her faith that yeah. she was very dedicated yeah. to. Yep. to keep you. Same with yeah. my mom to adopt me in the yeah. 60s as a white woman and all the harassment. Well, I don't know if I call harassment, but disagreement, I'm I sure. should say. Some, some harassment. Uh, yeah. I'm sure. um, with what she did. And and uh, so, yeah, people, and, to your point, mm -hmm. like to make, you have mm -hmm. to put some skin in the game yep. and, and take some risks to, yep. to truly um, make a difference. So... And I applaud so, you. I just want to say this, Chief Han. I, I, I really... I really applaud you for the work that you've done all these years and the bravery that it took. And it's like, um, you know, um, and like like me, like you, your mom put that in you, you yeah, know, so we absolutely. can make a difference. Even in our kids can grow up to do great things. So Well, I, I always say uh, that I, I don't want to do something that would make my mom reach down from heaven and snatch Woo! my last name Woo! right out my soul. <laughs> so, because... Uh, you know, my last name means a lot to me because yes. uh, the yes. sacrifice that was made, uh, made to mm -hmm. allow me to live mm -hmm. the life that I live, and mm -hmm. it changes generations. So you yes. think about your childhood mm -hmm. versus your children's childhood, childhood. right? And, Very different. Um, you have some amazing kids, not only from what they've accomplished in like their chosen fields, mm -hmm. going to college mm -hmm. and accomplishing mm -hmm. good things, but uh, in you know, maybe some people don't know. Mm -hmm. One of your sons is very accomplished in sports. Mm -hmm. He plays for the San Francisco 49ers. Mm -hmm. But I, I've i always thought, looking at your family, mm -hmm. that that is not the most... I mean, it is amazing to be able to be a good enough athlete, to be dedicated mm -hmm. enough to be able to play at the mm -hmm. highest level mm -hmm. in the entire world. But yet... It's not the crew to tie. No. <laughs> when you see him around tie. town, if yeah. you didn't... I mean, if he wasn't so large yeah, yeah. and... You didn't know, yeah. you would have no idea this guy yeah. plays at the top of uh, NFL, yeah. what he gives back, the, the things he does when he's mm -hmm. in town, mm -hmm. and his finances that he provides. Yeah. And yeah. I would uh, say that that is because of how he grew up and who he, mm -hmm. you know, you and mm -hmm. Gus, the environment mm -hmm. that you created mm -hmm. that I imagine your mom wanted to create for you, mm -hmm. but just the Couldn't. circumstances were Couldn't. different. Yeah. Right. I think my mom still talks about today. She said, if I, if I ever win the lottery, she says she would want to have a home for mothers with uh, single moms, but that they could stay at for a long time with a lot of resources until they get on their feet. You know, that's, that's the kind of thing she dreams of. Wow. And I, I know there's a need for that, but you know, it's so great. Even in every city, right. We know housing is a problem. Um, affordable housing is a problem. So, um, so talk yeah. about that a little bit. Now, fast forward to you're a pastor at, yeah. at Midtown, Midtown, which is a, a amazing Eclectic uh, mix of church that's extremely diverse. Yeah, in every way, right? Generationally, every way. ethnically, and growing. Social, economically, you know. Absolutely. Everything. Um, like you can find, you know, people at the top of their, uh, yep. you know, profession yep. with making yeah. huge salaries yep. and you can find people in the middle You can find class. people like me and you. We just barely <laughs> making it. We barely getting by on, yeah, a, yeah. on a passive salary, on a retired you know, <laughs> yes, yes. chief of police salary. Yes. We're really trying to make it, right? <laughs> so talk a little bit about the work you do in your church. Like you talked about Leah Tata Floyd mm -hmm. and the work you do mm -hmm. over there because what I see us as a society struggling with every day mm -hmm. is I, I do believe, even the people that I don't necessarily agree with their what they think needs to be done. Mm -hmm. But I do think the vast majority of people 
do actually want to do make so, tomorrow make better. Yeah, yeah I agree. But I think that they want to the, move forward. Yeah, the the rub is how how, how right. do you do it? And so right. they don't know how, and right. and we collectively don't right. know how. Right. And so uh, the work that you do, both through the church and mm -hmm. through other means. Talk about a little bit about what you do at Leah Tata Floyd and what you think that we collectively need to do so we don't have the circumstances of the jungle. Yeah, yeah. And um, only through certain things occurring were you able to, some people call it make it out. I yeah. don't like to refer yeah. to it because I don't feel like I made, made it, it out, out of Oak Park. Right. I didn't want to get out of Oak Park. Right, right, right. Um, but, you know, from the outside looking in, the neighborhoods are 10 times worse than they yeah, really gorgeous. are. Yeah. Um, so how do you think, and in, in through some of the work that you do, can we, like, make circumstances better for the, the eight-year-old Christas of the world yeah. that are growing up yeah. in all of this that you've I think about? it happens in a lot of ways, but I think it is. We do have to focus on, like we said earlier, we do have to get out of our own boxes and comfort zones and think about the generations that are behind us. And um, this is something that my kids grew up grew up doing. Uh, in fact, you know, um, I think Eric's first trip to Leah Tata Floyd was there used to be a young woman that um, did, she, she worked for Mercy Housing and she worked for Midtown. So she was like a pastor at Midtown. Eric is your son. Eric is my son, I'm sorry. <laughs> Eric Armstead of San Francisco 49ers. <laughs> Four-time man of the year nominee, <laughs> my gosh. You know, I guess the 49ers are just going to keep nominating him. But I think the work... Got to nominate him until he gets it. Right, exactly. <laughs> all, all of my kids, like my daughter is a, a junior high school counselor down in L.A. And she's worked at Leah Tata Floyd, worked with kids. Um, every, everybody in our family is just thinking about... My husband works with younger people. Mm -hmm. We work with a lot of young people at Midtown Church. One of the, one of the things that we were committed to was... Leah Tata Floyd and schools like that, that are underserved and underrepresented, Title I schools, how do you go in and mentor kids? How do you go in and offer them hope? I can still remember the different people in my life. When I grew up going to the Y, uh, the Y in Hollywood. I had to take two buses to get there in the summertime, but I remember the positive roles models that pulled me to the side and just invested a little. So mm -hmm. I think, I think change is all the different ways that we give back to the to the younger generation, whether that's being a teacher, whether that's being a counselor, whether that's being an athlete who puts your money where you know your mouth is, whether that's the police force looking for you know c candidates, and it's it's all of us. It's like that thing. It takes a village, mm -hmm. in our own way. So maybe I'm not you, and you're not me, but what can I do in my small what I seem to what seems to be small sphere of influence to make a difference and then when we collectively come together like at Midtown we got a bunch of stuff you can get behind you can say I don't know what to do sure well hey do this right. we, we serve the unhoused we give showers to the unhoused come serve on that team um, a couple years ago and, and we are still doing this today like we just at Christmas time we our congregation collected funds so that all the students at Leah Tata Floyd could have sweatshirts and gear to wear on their field trips. So you know, see what I'm saying? So sometimes we come together collectively to do things, and sometimes in our own lives, individually, we're doing things. It well, it sounds to me, and I have felt that way reading your book, um, that a lot of it is, and I think this is what your mom did for, for you from mm -hmm. birth, I, I would mm -hmm. guess, uh, is it really matters what the kid believes. Yes. But does the kid believe that they're yeah. worthy? Does yes. the kid believe that they have the ability to have dreams yeah. and chase yeah. dreams? You know, some of the things you said about your mom instilling pride mm -hmm. in your, 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 your heritage, yeah. your mom instilling education's importance, yeah. Yeah. feels like that stayed with you your whole, whole life. life. Um, yeah. And when I work with young people, I, I feel like that, the neighborhood or their circumstances has kind of, to a certain extent, robbed them of that. Like, they yes. don't have dreams. Like instead of being able to chase or your dreams, they, they the don't even dreams. feel they have the right to have a dream. Right, right? or they might have the wrong dreams or, yeah. by what they've seen. But right. maybe, and maybe they don't have parents. Like, you know, my mom had to work, so she had to be, you know, I was left alone a lot. But maybe there's other people in the community that just, like you said, just give you that one word of hope or spark well, something in you. And I love in the, I think it's the forward of your book, you thank a lot of people, your mm -hmm. two aunts, mm -hmm. uh, your best friend, Valerie, yeah. I think yeah. her name was. Yeah. Um, and 
So I love that you are make putting it right out in front. Like I didn't do this on my own. Right. I, in right. addition to the divine intervention right. and those sort right. of things, but you had people right. that, despite uh, n regardless of your circumstances or what neighborhood you grew up in, they were in at the mm -hmm. same mm -hmm. similar neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. You helped each other. Yeah. Um, and I think that w we have to realize one person can can really change yeah. uh, the trajectory of a, of of a young person's person. life. Yeah, especially a young person. So before I get to your book and we uh, close out, I want right. to talk uh, a little bit ago, you talked a little about, um, I know even in your book, you talked about there are some circumstances of bullying mm -hmm. that where you were mm -hmm. bullied for various reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and you said something I've never heard before. You said uh, poverty is somewhat of a, of a, of bully. a bully. What what do you, what do you mean by that? I just, you know, I'm just still just, working through that but you know bullies um assault you and 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 attack you and and cause you to live in fear and you intimidate know, you intimidate you right <laughs> all of those things and i just think poverty does the same thing growing up in perpetual poverty is like what we talked about earlier and it, it, it intimidates you it takes away your your courage it, it you know it can cause you to to shrink back and i just think all the things that you know, for me, that growing up in a certain neighborhood with with lack of a lot of different things really bullied me. And it just, you know, it takes people to come and stand up against the bullies. Yes. Yeah, and then they right. break down. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. You know, right? If you had a they big do. brother, if I had a big brother, I always dreamed, like, I wish I was not the oldest. I wish I had a big brother to come along and right. say, better not mess with my sister. Right. You better not mess with my brother. I think that's what we need to do in our communities. And sometimes it doesn't feel like it's enough or... We're making a big enough impact, but I think that's what we need to do. Like stand up and say, "Hey, you better not mess with these students at Leah Tata right. Floyd, right? Because now I'm standing in the gap for them. I'm standing as their protector, making sure that they're safe and making sure that they, you know, um, survive, so to speak." It's interesting. You earlier you said you never felt safe when you were uh -huh. a kid, and uh -huh. when you said that, I was thinking about my daughter uh -huh. and like. I think that's one of my biggest roles. Is yes. I, I don't ever want them not to be safe. Exactly. I mean, you think about what you say to your kids, drive slower, yeah. be safe, yeah, it's raining. My daughter right. just drove back from the Bay Area right. back to her dorm yesterday. Yeah. We were like, it's raining, it's drive raining. slow, be safe. Don't leave, <laughs> yeah. stay there. Well, that's what Katrina said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Katrina stay, says stay put. <laughs> she said don't go to San Francisco at all. At all, so. exactly, exactly. So uh, I want to close out a little bit with, um, so you wrote a book called Illegitimate uh -huh. um, by Krista Armstead. Uh -huh. So... Why did you write a book? What right. was your like, the motivation, the the mm -hmm. um, the purpose of you putting all this work into a I book? I know, Chief. I just feel so honored to still be living today. Like, you know, it's, again, I'm just I, I think a lot about like how can I make that matter? Well, and what I mean by that is I don't desire like you know a bunch of money in the bank or um, just want to love on people and make a difference in our community, make an impact, just tell the next person, like, you matter. I'm surprised I'm sitting across from you. I shouldn't be here. I should be a, stati a statistic. Mm -hmm. I should not be here. And so many of my, the kids I grew up with are not here. Didn't, didn't make it out of what I, didn't survive what I survived. They got right. shot and they're gone. We went to their funerals. Um, so I feel very honored and privileged to be sitting across from you today, to be living this life that I'm living. It's like, it's two worlds, right? So unless you read the book, if I didn't write the book and tell you the story, you would never think, you'd think, oh, Yeah, I've known you for several years. Right. I didn't know all oh, that stuff. Oh, that's the Armstead. Yeah. It probably, you know, she probably was always yeah. this way. But then you learn, no. So by telling the story, I hope to encourage people to um, join us in making changes the way we can and just really offer hope. And like you said, if I can just talk to one young person and say, hey, would you just not think about giving up this month? Like I gave out my phone number, like take my phone number, I'll meet with you for coffee, I'll do whatever. I'll connect you to counseling at Midtown, I'll make sure you get some mental health resources, I will, I'll do whatever it takes. Personally, I will invest my time to make sure, can you just get through the next month? Right. Can you get through, you know, I've offered Richard, I'm like, Richard, how you doing in school? Let me help you, come up here. Come up here. I'll meet you and help you with your homework. Providing those types of support and resources, and I think, and then joining a community that has that same vision is why I wrote the book. 
So uh, we'll get on how people can get the book uh-huh. in a second. Uh-huh. But uh, second to last uh-huh. question. Second to last, second to last. If somebody is inspired by all the different areas you covered today. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, whether it's, mm. you know, trying to help communities uh-huh. or help people not harm themselves, uh-huh. get through that moment in time. Mm-hmm. Um, how can they help? whether it's through the church or the other things that you do, uh-huh. how can somebody that is sitting there going, I want to help, mm-hmm. I want to help make tomorrow better for all people, uh-huh. um, but I just, you know, I'm going to work every day, I might have some kids, I'm going to their practice, mm-hmm. I'm busy, I just don't know what mm-hmm. to do. Yeah, I think there, I mean, there's so much, like obviously you can, you, you can, you can uh, email me and I'll give you, I'll give you a whole bunch of suggestions, but you know, <laughs> stuff that we're doing in the community at Midtown, or maybe, Maybe, I don't know, taking your talent and your skill and could you just share that with one kid? We're, think, we're talking about, um, so a friend of mine sits on the board for Girl Scouts mm-hmm. and she happens to be African American. And she was, she's talking about traditionally Girl Scouts have not been available to, to, to kids of color because the mom is usually the troop leader. So we're talking about, there's some philanthropists that said, hey, we'll pay for the fees. Will some of the people at the church get together and be these scout leaders and can we take Girl Scouts to Leotata Floyd or communities that where you traditionally wouldn't see it? I mean that's big brothers, big sisters. I mean right. you name it, uh there's so many ways we can Google, how can I get back here in Sacramento? <laughs> get involved with um with the with the displaced community. Get in, if you if politics is your thing, figure out how you can you know, well, we could use some people on that. Right, right. Some good ones, though, right? <laughs> yes, Help us solve yes, yes. some of these problems. Show up at some city council meetings. I've been yeah. thinking about that. Like, I went and met with them. You, you probably would know this, but there's a, a women's organization in Oak Park, and my, my brain just lost it. But anyway, they've women's been... Women's Civic Improvement Center? Uh, yes. So they have been helping women for years, right? Well, I go by there. We donate things back to them so they can continue on, you know, doing what they do. We take clothes and jackets and diapers and milk, mm-hmm. whatever we can take. So I was asking her, what are you, what are you doing about, you know, this, the number of displaced women there are? She said, nothing. There's, there isn't any housing in Sacramento. We're going to have to make some, some changes with the legislature. So I'm just thinking, well, how do I, how do I get involved in and that? It's exceptionally hard for women. That right, are right, out right. Homeless, yeah. homeless, yeah. homeless woman. Yeah. Sometimes with kids. Yeah. I know you see it. I see it. So yeah. I would just say, you know, however you're wired. Like, don't you don't have to be wired like me. But take your your wiring and just donate an hour. Yeah, good. So lastly, so I know I I think I got your book on Amazon. Okay. But I would highly recommend, as I said at the beginning, I'm not a what, what was it, voracious, voracious reader <laughs> unless it's history or sports. Okay. Um, but I, I put a little sports I, in there for you, I, though. I, I'm going to have to get you to the, sign this before the, I leave, too, by the way. it talks about sports. True, It talks true. about Gus and true. his work with the Kings and That's basketball. True. So bit. I should have just went to the it very last bit, chapter. Right. You just turned to the end like he did. <laughs> like he did, Chief. He skipped to the back part, oh, too. Oh, see, I'm going to have to get on <laughs> about that. He skipped to the yeah. back, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I would highly recommend people reading it because, one, it's a very easy read, and okay. it, it makes you not want to put it down. Um, and I think it's inspiring and, um, you know, probably touches a lot of people's own experiences mm-hmm. through different parts of your mm-hmm. journey. Mm-hmm. So how could somebody uh, outside of Amazon, which is, I think, Books at, in Oak Underground Books in Oak Park, Park right, on 35th yes. Street. Yes, I've, okay. been, I've loved Mama Rose. You know, I heard there's very few women who are bookstore owners in the whole country. Well, and if you're from Oak Park, you know who Mama Rose is. You know who is. Mama Kevin Rose is. Kevin mom. Johnson's mom. So <laughs> our ex, ex-mayor ex and friend. So I'd love for people to pick it up. At, awesome. You go there and say, order the book. I should have picked mine up there. I know. Uh, don't I tell know. her I didn't. I know. I know. <laughs> so do you have any uh, book signings coming up? I know you did several. Do I you do. have any coming it, up? I, 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 the, the date is escaping me, but I'm going to do another book signing at Underground. I did a book okay. signing there a few months ago in May. And can they go on a website or they'll, something they'll to find them? They'll go on their website. On, on Underground Underground's Books? Web, yes. Website? Okay. Yes, yes. So, so come. We, like, we had 60, 70 people. We packed it out. It was just Good. a great conversation. Some of the same things we're talking about. It's cool because it's right there in Oak Park yep. where I spent uh, you know, the first 15 years. Again, of, the best neighborhood in the Sacramento. The best neighborhood. I didn't get to live there a like biased, you did. But right, right. Just a little bias. Just a little bias. Well, and I, I tell you that that very street, that corner, uh-huh. when I was growing up, uh-huh. was not somewhere you hung out. Right, um, right. 
Not the if wood, you want to live. The Woodruff Hotel, drugs, yeah, yeah. women being trafficked. Yes. Just, and now you look at it, you, I, I don't think somebody that goes there today that's never been there before can even imagine what that corner no, used to look like. No, the, because the little flower shop that's across the street from the bookstore, mm -hmm. remember that used to be a tire? Like That was like used tires? Oh, yeah. And, you know, I got my hair. My first haircut was at a barbershop right across. Right the there, and then that. there was a. There used to be a KFC right there on Broadway. I worked at that. It KFC. couldn't stay open. I don't know if you you remember this well, because they kept robbing it. Well, that KFC when I would have been in like 1984 yeah. when I'm a young teenager. Yeah, yeah. That was my first like legit job where you have a company on the paycheck. But it we had bulletproof glass. Yes, I remember. In the front, and I'm, you put your I'm food in LA. a little circle. I'm thing. coming from LA. You're like, what is like, this? I thought it was gonna be safe here in Sacramento. This is they got bulletproof glass at their KFC. So. But the owners of that were mm -hmm. Mr. and Mrs. Rogers, the African American. You knew American. them. They uh, they hired me. Wow. That's who I worked for. Wow. Yeah, so we need a, more of that, right? I was a cook. We need yes. more Mr. and Mrs. Rogers Absolutely. to have businesses where they're hiring, you know, students back. Yeah. Just different things. Community awesome. gardens, there's so much T Farm we could do. Okay, so everybody's going to go to the website at yep. Underground Books, find yep. out when your book signing is. Yep. And there's probably going to be about 300 people there, so you might need to move next door to the Guild <laughs> to Theater. The Guild instead. Um, but I just want to say thank you, not only for being on A Way Forward today, but for all that you do. Thank um, you. For the family that you have helped raise for the church family that you help lead, mm -hmm. for the community that you help lead. Mm -hmm. We need, uh, I, I mean, it's a little biased, but we need more people like you. Aww. That's how we make tomorrow better for thank all you. people. So well, thank I'm you so for everything you do. I'm glad to be affiliated with you and your beautiful family. I feel like all of us together, you know, can make such a, just a, a big impact. We can put our, we can do it. Chief Han, we can do it. Yeah, okay. We can think. I'm, I'm all for it. We can, I, we can do You this. know, you see things go over and over. The jungles of the world just yeah. stay the jungles. Like, That's we need like, to stop that. Yeah. We need to give all kids the same so if you, opportunities. So if you lay your head down tonight and you think of something, and you, you need me to come alongside of you and help you. Okay, I'm going to write that down. And you tell, you tell right. me. I need we, you to sign that after sign that done. down. <laughs> sign that down. We will jump in. One of the big purposes of A Way Forward is to hear different voices and different opinions because that is how we can make informed decisions ourselves. So if you are someone that would like to come on a way forward to express your opinion, go to chiefhan.com forward slash podcast. Chief, H-A-H-N dot com forward slash podcast.